Living by Design with host Kathy Holloway Hill. Kathy is a strong, powerful voice. She entertains, informs, and inspires her audiences everywhere she goes. Holloway Hill and welcome to the Living by Design show. As promised, we are kicking off our first interview with our first professional in our five week Healthy by Design mental health awareness series. And I'm so excited about this series because we are in a mental health crisis. And I would go as far as to say a global crisis. But we are really going to try to dig into everything that we can over the next five weeks to help you pull up out or at least give you some tools and tips to pull up out of this abyss, this dark abyss that you're in. So today, our guest is Dr. Bonetta Johnson, and I'm so excited that she has joined us today to talk about the first aspect in our series, which is you, and we're going to start talking about you in relation to trauma. So Dr. Johnson, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your practice. My name is Dr. Bonetta Johnson. I am grateful to be here with you today. Um, we have a small private practice on the west side in Speedway. Um, the practice has been established since 2010. And we are honored and have the privilege of providing quality mental health care to the Indiana community. Well, I can believe that. And I am so happy about that because we really, really need you right now. We have had a very difficult last couple of years and people mm -hmm. need help. So thank you so much for being part of this series. So let's just uh, kick it in and jump right in and talk about trauma because that is one of the huge aspects of what a lot of people are dealing with and they may not even realize it. So mm -hmm. just talk about the definition of trauma and more specifically how it relates to a child uh, when you deal with, like there's a lot of children that are having to see a lot of death and, and all this stuff around them. So just mm -hmm. talk about trauma in general and then from childhood perspective, how trauma affects children. So trauma includes the experience of an event that has included a death, serious injury, threat, violence to oneself. It can take the form of various experiences where it could be an experience where one has directly experienced a traumatic event. One could have witnessed a traumatic event. One could even have learned about a traumatic event and be traumatized by that. Mm -hmm. And so there are uh, various ways in which one can be exposed to some form of trauma that could feel traumatic. Yeah, and, and, and yet that's, that's very good. Thank you for that. And when, when we look at COVID, so let, let's mm -hmm. talk about COVID and children have had to deal with being at home, not being in school, being away from their friends, and then they see their friends. Now they have to wear a mask. Sometimes they have to see grandma die, grandpa die, auntie, whoever die. So they have had to deal with being away from their little friends in school, having to be homeschooled or virtual school or whatever they call it, and then having to see their loved ones die quite a few of their loved ones die where typically a child may deal with death, you know, once or twice in their childhood, but these children in the last couple of years are dealing with it tenfold. So how, how would you expect that a child would process that emotionally and mentally? Well, um, 
oftentimes with children, we do have that awareness that consistency and stability are often extremely helpful for their overall wellness, their well being. And one of the challenges that have come across as a result of COVID is that it has impacted and oftentimes interfered with children even and adults being able to feel that life is consistent, that there is something, uh, uh, there's consistency, that there's reliability in one's experience and their reality. And it increases and creates even more of a, a sense of an unknown that for mm -hmm. some people can be, it can be very difficult to figure out how to manage the experience of a overarching lingering unknown on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, you know, you know that, that, that's good. I love exactly what you said, and I totally agree. What can parents do? If, if a parent were to ask, you know, how can I help my child cope with, with this, this pandemic, this trauma that is affecting everybody mentally, it's affecting the parents, but what can the parent do or what can a teacher do, someone that's in this child's life you know, a lot. What, what can they do to help? Well, oftentimes I think there are two uh, pieces of to do that sometimes we can overlook, but can be very powerful, not just within COVID, but within lots of parts and places of our lives. And it includes communicating and listening. And so within this aspect of COVID, thinking about children, listening to them, and talking to them, allowing for them to share how they're feeling, giving them space to be able to talk about what's happening in their lives. Sometimes within various communities, I know within my experience as an African-American woman, that idea of children um, are to be seen and not heard, that can still be present for some children. And if they are experiencing Heightened, heightened feelings and emotions as a result of COVID, they need to be listened to. They need someone who has an interest in what it is that they're experiencing because they could be experiencing stress, anxiety, and depression as a result of COVID. So communicating and listening. Following that, related to what I had just shared, trying to find a way to implement and increase the consistency within one's home when the environment and the outside world doesn't feel consistent. I absolutely love that. That is so critical to be able to talk and communicate as you stated and let them get their feelings out. And I know sometimes that can be very difficult parents. I know sometimes that, you know, you feel like you're so overwhelmed that you can't even help yourself and let alone your child. So, you know, I, I really think that that that's a good that's a good way to look at it. And if we can just get through that or get past that, that would be awesome. Dr. Dr. Johnson, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to be right back with more of this episode of our Healthy by Design Mental Health Awareness. Welcome back. We are still here with Dr. Johnson and we're just gonna pick right up where we left off. So Dr. Johnson, you were talking about what parents can do and maybe even teachers now that the children are, are back in school. And I really like that, uh, being able to, to listen. I mean, we all need that actually, I mean, even adults. Having someone to listen to you and not just listen and, and you know talk over top of you, but but hear you, hear hear your concern, and try to help you through it. Because isn't it true that if a child, like you said, you know, you don't have to even be experiencing it. A child doesn't have to have COVID, but if they're seeing their loved ones die, and they're seeing their parents fight about it you know, one believes this and the other one believes that, and they're seeing this, that that's trauma. Yeah. So if all that's happening in their childhood, won't it follow them into adulthood? And, and how will it manifest itself if, if that happens? 
Yes, it will follow them into adulthood. You are correct. Um, the manifestation uh, can look a variety of ways. There is, like most things, a spectrum to an anxiety, depression, trauma, and depending on the level of resilience that that child has, the level of resources that they have, um, their overall environment, their village, that can have an impact on how that traumatic experience will linger and manifest within their life. And so a child who has more people wrapped around them, that greater village, they have other um, uh, communities that they're involved in, they're active in extracurricular activities or church, they, they do have that grandmother or grandfather. Children that have other means of engagement with a variety of people who are healthy, they could have greater levels of resilience and that can help them if they are exposed to some form of a trauma. A lot of people that are actually dealing with trauma right now, I mean, this has nothing to do with COVID because, you know, mental illness has been around for as far back as, as, as I've been in existence. So a lot of adults are dealing with trauma from their childhoods, but they don't even know it. So what are some of the signs that adults can look for in themselves to realize that they actually have some trauma that they haven't dealt with? Well, for, with thinking about what you mentioned in regards to parents and parenting, there are some parents who are triggered by their children, um, depending on various things that may be coming up for their child. Uh, maybe their child is developing into uh, some particular phase of life, and maybe they experience trauma in that phase of their life. And so they might become hypervigilant with that child because they are afraid that something may happen to their child in the same way that it happened to them. Um, mostly one of the main indicators is when whatever we are dealing with inside, when it begins to have a negative impact on our overall functioning. And so we may find ourselves not being able to show up for work or we're there and we're not able to concentrate we find ourselves irritable. Anything that someone says to us, it just feels personal and attacking. Or maybe I don't want to leave the house anymore. I don't feel like I need to nourish myself. I don't feel um, the worthy or competent. Um, it's hard for me to get out of bed. So we begin to see that there's a difficulty with living life in a healthy manner. Now, what about addiction? Because sometimes I know addictions can kind of jump in there and people may not have any clue where this addiction came from. You know, how did I get hooked on alcohol or how did I get hooked on, on, on pain meds or, or, or drugs or food even? You know, how do I get, how did I get hooked on these things? Can that be one of, one of the manifestations of childhood trauma? It can be. There are lots of um, neurotransmitters and things that dopamine and, and various types of um, biological pieces that are occurring within our bodies that um, can be released after we eat or um, with the use of various types of drugs or alcohol. And mm -hmm. so when we are experiencing trauma, even if it's just for five minutes, Sometimes we want reprieve. We want to be released from that. And there are times where, when there is a use of drugs, alcohol, food, sex, shopping, um, gambling, mm -hmm. sometimes those things can give us that moment of reprieve from what is haunting us, even if it's five minutes. I hope you guys are listening because if you really want to know what is at the root cause of some of the addictions that Dr. Johnson just named, then, you know, try to get help, which, which really brings me to, to my next uh, question about healing. Um, you know, we have to start 
the process of healing. And that's where people like you, Dr. Johnson, come in to help us uncover all of these, these things that are going on in our subconscious that we don't even realize. Uh, Cause I know uh, one of the things that typically happens and it might happen in your practice as well, is you try to go back to the person's childhood and ask questions to find out, is there any trauma that has not been resolved? So is, is that the path to healing? It can be. Um, various therapists take different modes um, of getting to what may be ailing that adult. Some therapists do reflect on childhood, uh, the theoretical orientation that um, I adopt. It does incorporate looking into childhood. I do believe that it has a significant impact on how we are as adults. Um, but there are various roads and ways to get to healing. And one thing that you mentioned that I think is important to come back to is what you said in regards to, and we don't even know it. And so that insight and awareness is key. It's number one. And sometimes we might have someone close to us or maybe even a coworker, they may notice something. And we don't want to acknowledge that that person may see what's going on or can identify that something is happening with us. And maybe that person might be on to something. And so that piece that you mentioned about acknowledging that something just might be wrong is an initial starting point. It has to be there. One cannot embark on healing or address anything that is occurring within self if we don't acknowledge that something could be occurring. Recognition is the first step. If you don't recognize or feel that something is just off, something is not right, I shouldn't have this compulsive uh desire, this, this compulsion to do whatever, I, this compulsion to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and eat, you know, five pints of ice cream or, or, or gamble all of my money away or, you know, and, and this is just really getting exciting for me. So we're going to take another quick break and we're going to be right back. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. Johnson and I am really enjoying this conversation because we are getting to the bottom of so much distress that we're dealing with in the area of mental health awareness. So we were talking about Dr. Johnson, we were talking about uh, the healing process, and we were also talking about recognition. So I am going to ask everyone who is listening and everyone who is doing this show to please do a self-assessment. Is there anything in your life that you feel a compulsion to do. Like you almost just can't help it. You're just being pulled toward it. And just have an open mind when, when you do that. Just have an open mind about it. If you need to pray or meditate or, or however you connect with, with that, that inner guy, then do that because that's what we're here for. We're here to help you heal. Right, Dr. Johnson? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, some resources. So Dr. Johnson, uh, are you accepting new patients? Currently, I am not accepting new patients, but okay. in my practice, we have several providers who I directly supervise who are accepting new clients. We are a Medicaid, Medicare, and Healthy Indiana plan provider, and so we do provide services to clients who are insured by uh, Hoosier HealthWise, Hoosier Care Connect, the Healthy Indiana plan. We also take most commercial insurance and we have a sliding fee that's based on um, income and number of dependents. Excellent. And what is the name of your, your practice and the number, the contact information? The name of the practice is Hope Haven Psychological Resource. Again, that's Hope Haven Psychological Resource. 
And the number is 241 Hope. 241 Hope. Excellent. And that's right there on your screen. So if you do want help and you do not have a therapist, then now Dr. Johnson herself is not accepting new patients, but she does have colleagues within her practice that are. So please reach out. Uh, she's an excellent resource. And right now, Dr. Johnson, uh, one of the things that, that I did do is I, I promised uh, my viewers that I would take some emails and if they had a question about their specific situation, that I would read their email on the air. So we're going to just take a couple of those right now. Uh, and we're going to read their question on the air. And if you want to go ahead and, and give some information to them, that would be awesome. And those of you, uh, if it's not your question, then you may be able to benefit from the answer also. So uh, the first one I have is... Um, I don't want to take meds, but I've been diagnosed with general anxiety disorder and depression. What options do I have or are there any natural remedies that are available? Well, if, if this individual has not sought individual therapy um, or even group therapy, I would recommend that if um, there's a desire to not go the medication route, and so I would try that first. And if it still seems like functioning is continuing to be impaired, then I would suggest checking in with their um, primary care doctor to receive a referral uh, for a psychiatrist. There are a substantial amount of hereditary components that are interwoven within mental health. And just like if, if someone has high cholesterol or high blood pressure, um, we may take some form of a medicine um, because our bodies have had an impact on our wellness. And so our mind and our body are not disconnected. They are one. And so there could be a biological basis to an individual's anxiety and depressive symptoms. And if there is something out there that works for you in regards to um, medication, it is not a failure. Um, at times for some people, the medication can just help to give them a little ease so that therapy can be even more effective. And so it's not an end all be all, but I do encourage medication if it feels like what you've done so far is not working. You know, I absolutely love that answer because I am one of those people when my, my mother passed back in 2002, it was a lot going on. I was going through divorce and my mother passed and it, it was, it was, it was piled on. And I took an antidepressant for about three months and that was it. Like you said, it got me over the hump. And that's why I loved that answer because I think a lot of people feel like if they start on meds that they have to be on meds for the rest of their life. And that's just not true. I mean, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's EMDR. There are, aren't there Dr. Johnson? There are multiple yes, remedies that don't involve meds, but you could do them both together. Mm -hmm. And in terms of that natural piece that was also included in the question there, there could be some nutritional aspects that could also be impacting one's anxiety if this individual might um, consume a lot of caffeine. Um, there are various other types of, of things that we take into our body that could impact um, our feelings of calm. And so it may be worth checking in with a nutritionist, a dietitian. If I'm eating a lot of sugar, how is that impacting my overall mood? And so there are some other pieces to that too, but um, we don't want to lose sight of the biological basis that can be um, included within anxiety and depression. Yes, absolutely. And just one more question I want to try to get in. This person says that um, they're having a really, really, really bad situation. What can they do to control their compulsive eating? 
they can't seem to control their compulsive eating. Well, it sounds like this person is really on the right track with sharing their experience with you. And so we talked about that awareness and insight. And so they're there. They have this idea, this awareness that something is not okay. And so my encouragement is to reach out. Just like we have a personal village, we also can have a professional village. And there are various resources in the community that can assist with something like um, disordered eating or eating where it, you don't feel comfortable. And so uh, one agency is the Care Center. They're here in town. They specialize in, um, in eating disorders or uh, when we have challenges with eating. I like that. That's awesome. I totally agree with you when you say there are resources out there and all we have to do, our job is easy. We have two things to do, recognize and reach out. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm asking you to do. And that's what I'm going to leave you with. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for all your incredible knowledge. Thank you for being part of this series. And we thank you for joining us for this episode of the Living by Design show. And we will see you same time next week in our continued series on mental health awareness. Good night, everyone.